Good morning, fellow nature lovers. Welcome to the kickoff Master National Presents of 2023. We are excited to have Kimberly Saison today. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. Uh, Kimberly is a certified Master Naturalist since 2017 uh, and a volunteer with the Master Entomology uh, Specialist, which is uh, code for insects. Um, she's had the bug for nature for a long time and focusing her attention on backyard mothing and gale forming loss. You can find her on iNaturalist along with nest box monitoring out in Keller, Texas. When she's not outside discovering nature, she works at the Botanical Research Institute in Fort Worth, Texas. Further ado, here's Kimberly Saison with her presentation on Bluebird nest boxes. Take it away. Thank you very much, Matt. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, somebody give me a thumbs up that you can hear me. Oh, good, I saw one already. <laughs> Excellent, you guys are on the game. And I'm going to uh, share my screen here. And Cameron, um, before we get started, just so yes. we know, uh, the, the people know that this will be recorded. Um, uh, this uh, episode will be recorded and then posted later at the uh, library website. And their babies, all the babies. Oh God. Great, okay. So again, Matt, can tell me if you can see my my screen now. My yep. slides. Looks looks like some little baby birds. Little baby That's birds. That's my babies. Yep. Well, Whoa. thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, I, as Matt said, my name is Kimberly Sasson. I am a master naturalist, and um, and I am what they refer to as a generalist. I have a tendency to. Um, to get interested in one thing for a couple of months and then I'll jump to something else and then I'll come right back to it. And I'm a little bit all over the place um, just because my interests are so varied. And I was not a birder. Uh, when I started the Master Naturalist program, I was not interested in birds. Um, of course, I, I mean, I like birds, but I like all animals. And I had no uh, particular interest in anything other than um, maybe plants because they didn't move very fast. And I enjoyed looking at flowers and, um, and taking pictures of nature, things like that. And uh, there was a need in the Keller area where I live to start monitoring uh, some bluebird boxes that had been there for many years. And, um, and I did a little research and found out that no one was monitoring them. And so I jumped in and started doing that and now I've been doing it for, oh gosh, I don't know how many years, several years now, um, five, six maybe. And, uh, and I love it. You can't, you can't pull me off my bluebird babies because I love them so much. So let's jump to, uh, to our program today. I'm going to tell you a little about, a bit about uh, monitoring bluebirds and uh, why we do it, how you can do it and answer any questions you might have about it. So first of all, let me give you a little bit of information, uh, some background stuff so that you're not furiously scribbling notes if you don't, if you don't want to take notes, you don't have to. I will be uh, working off of what we call the NEST monitoring manual from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. You can go to nestwatch.org and find this manual. It's all online. And so I've taken that information and put this into a presentation. I'm not reading from the manual. Um, there's a lot more that's in there. So I, I encourage you to go find that manual online and read through it. Uh, it's, it's very informative um, and it's much more than just bluebirds too. Um, and anything that I might say today uh, that conflicts with that manual, then the manual will always take precedence over that. So let's talk about the bluebirds. Um, I often get asked, is that big giant squawky bird in my front yard a bluebird? And what they're referring to are blue jays. So these are the bluebirds. These uh, are the birds that we're referring to today. The, uh, the Eastern bluebird is the species that's here in the Metroplex area. There are actually three different types of bluebirds in the United States. The Eastern Bluebird is a small thrush with a big round head, a large eye, a plump body, and a very alert posture. Males are a very vivid, deep blue with a 
rusty color on the throat and on the belly. And birds, um, especially bluebirds, depending on the light that they're in, they may have more of a gray appearance or a brownish appearance. Um, that has to do with the light reflecting off of the blue colors. So sometimes they may not look as bright as they actually are. Um, and you can see some of that females are a more uh, muted color, but it looks the same kind of appearance in the females as well. And then the juveniles are, are uh, very similar, but with speckled feathers, uh, especially around their shoulders. They live in open areas um, with very little understory and sparse ground cover. They're most common along pastures, agricultural fields, suburban parks, backyards, and golf courses, which is why they're so great for us to be able to monitor them because they're in the same areas that we are. And they are year round residents in Texas. So we see them even in the winter. Early that are caught around, such as caterpillars, beetles, crickets, grasshoppers, and spiders. In fall and winter, the bluebirds eat a large amount of fruit. Uh, for nesting, bluebirds put their nests in natural cavities or in nest boxes. They are secondary cavity uh, nest users, meaning that they will uh, typically select old woodpecker holes and, uh, and reuse those up to 50 feet off of the ground. Older bluebirds are more likely to use a nest box although um, that's not necessarily a rule. Uh, I've seen very young birds use the nest box as well. Uh, behavior, bluebirds can sight their tiny prey from 60 feet or more away. I'll tell you a little story about that in a little bit. They fly fairly low to the ground with a fast but irregular pattern to their wing beats. And males will attack other species that they deem a threat, including other cavity nesting birds like house sparrows. Males will attract females to the nest with a display in which he carries a bit of nesting material into and out of the nest. And once a female enters the nest hole with him, the pair bond is typically established and then often remains for several seasons. Conservation, uh, some people might be surprised that they are of low concern now. Um, bluebird populations fell in the early 20th century as aggressive introduced species, such as starlings and house sparrows, made available nest holes increasingly difficult for bluebirds to hold on to. Um, in the 60s and 70s, set in the 60s and 70s, there were uh, a group of naturalist-oriented people that established what we do, which is monitoring the nest box, uh, putting boxes on trails, and that campaign alleviated a lot of the problem with um, birds finding places to nest. And so you'll see some of that information later on as well. So they have recovered quite nicely. After a male has attracted a female to his nest site by carrying the material in and out of the hole and perching and fluttering his wings. The female is the one who does all of the nest building. She makes the nest by loosely weaving uh, the material, the grasses and pine needles together, and then lining it with finer grasses and occasionally uh, horsehair or feathers. Um, and uh, often bluebirds will use the same nest for multiple broods in the wild. In nest boxes, we don't typically allow that. And the reason for that is just, um, we don't want to encourage uh, problems like ants to take over for uh, where there might be eggs that got crushed or food material that got left in there. Um, problems arise from that. So we clean out the nest boxes, but in nature, they will use that. And bluebirds are in incredibly clean birds to begin with. They have two to seven eggs per clutch with five being the most common. And they have one to three broods each year. If a nest fails for some reason, they may stop for the year. So uh, one of the things that I've noticed in my uh, recent years of monitoring 
is that if a particular box has something go wrong for whatever reason, whether it be a predator or um, an, a clutch fails because of um, the weather, that's, a, that's happened too. They may decide not to lay any more eggs and that's it. Or they may move to a different location completely. Of course, I might not know that. Um, but that box would go unused after that. Incubation period is 11 to 19 days. Nestling period is 17 to 21 days. So if you can imagine, they are ready to fledge. They're ready to fly out of that box in less than three weeks from being born. And you can see in the top left picture here, these are um, fairly new hatchlings. They, they do have uh, some... Um, tufts of fur on them. So they're a few days old, uh, but they are, they grow very quickly <laughs> and they have to, of course, uh, but they're ready to fledge within three weeks. Eggs are pale blue or in some cases white or even pink. And the ha hatchlings are naked except for the sparse tufts of dingy gray brown, a dingy gray down with their eyes closed and they're very clumsy. Uh, the top right photo, you can see two juveniles, the, the spotted ones with a female, the one on the right. They're actually uh, birds that I watched. I, I uh, watched them fledge and they uh, stayed around the area and watched the father uh, teach them how to hunt insects in the grass. So they're sitting on top of the box or on top of actually a different box on top of a bat box, watching him teach another one of the juveniles how to swoop down and grab the food and then carry it away. So it, it was really interesting to see. It's not something that they just innately know. Um, I'm sure that there is some of that, uh, but they, there is a little bit of the parents helping them to learn how to hunt as well, which was an interesting observation for me. And in the bottom right, you can see the female likes to stay on the nest sometimes too. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, monitoring boxes. Um, you may be here for... Uh, for monitoring boxes in your own backyard or for helping out with monitoring boxes, say in a park with um, other master naturalists or for any number of reasons. And I hope to answer all of your questions for that. Uh, but let's try to tackle both of those uh, two issues. One of which is you can purchase boxes for the current cost is $30 with the Texas Bluebird Society. If you go on their webpage, they have a list of uh, volunteers that make the boxes and, and uh, where you can purchase those boxes from the closest person to you. You can also purchase boxes at um, local stores, um, Wild Birds Unlimited. There's several different types of boxes. Um, but what I want to uh, to make you aware of is that not all boxes are the same. So bluebirds do have some special requirements uh, that we'll talk about here in just a second. But I want to point out to you that there are different kinds of boxes. Some open on the top, some open on the side, um, some open on the front. So I uh, encourage you to think through whichever you will buy. Um, I have found that the ones uh, opening on the top are very difficult to clean out, uh, but yet the one on the far right here, uh, it's actually made of, of plastic uh, recycled, I think milk bottles or something along that line. So they last a long time, um, but they have several different ways to open. So that helps in cleaning out and being able to see the birds from different angles if need be. So you can see that uh, the ones from the Texas Bluebird Society here open on the side. 
And I have found that those are my favorite, maybe just because that's uh, the most common ones that I use. The Texas Bluebird Society also uses um, what we call Texas weather boxes, which means that they're built for summer heat temperatures, which as you guys know, get over 100 degrees in the summertime. Uh, bluebirds will start nesting now. Um, believe it or not, they're out there right now. Uh, picking out those spots. The, as the weather is warm in January, off and on, even though we will continue to get freezes in February, they are out there now looking for boxes and trying to decide what the best location is. So uh, now is the right time to be putting your box out there. If you get your box out too late, if it takes you a couple months to get a box purchased and installed, that's okay. Um, but be prepared that it may take another year for, for birds to actually start using the box. And that's all right. Sometimes they need that time to make sure that there's not predators around and that that box is not going to overheat in the summertime, things like that. So it's okay for, for that to go unused for uh, a season. And if it continues after that, then you can try looking at some other alternatives. I've had people um, call me up and ask me, why is my why are birds not using my box? And I'll go through some of these things here with them and, uh, and often find out that just a small change is all that's needed. So um, as you can see on the left, the entrance hole needs to be a certain size. Um, the depth of the box also needs to be a certain size as well as the width of it. So these are all geared towards the bluebirds. It helps to um, prevent other birds from getting in. Larger birds can't get in. Um, raccoons can't reach their hands in to grab eggs as easily, uh, et cetera. And um, the, the uh, Texas Bluebird Society website also has uh, the plans if you want to make your own nest box, which I also think is a great idea, uh, especially if there's several several of you that want to make um, a, a park or something like that, an area, and you'd, you'd want to get together and have four or five nest boxes at the same place. So nest box placement, you'll uh, ideally want to place it between four and the opening between four and six feet high. That is uh, the easiest for you to be able to monitor, uh, but also a height that is good for the birds. If you have uh, bir if you have pets in the backyard, then please be aware of that, especially if you have cats. Obviously, those are predators to our our uh, birds of all sorts. Um, but dogs as well, especially when the nestlings are about to start fledging, you can work with that. Um, you can keep your dogs in or, um, or limit the area that they're uh, allowed to uh, be outside alone, or you can put the nest box on another side of the house, maybe where the, the dogs aren't allowed to get into that part of the yard. Um, there are options there but four to six feet if you're monitoring. If you want it to be higher than that, you can certainly do that. Um, they will go, like I said, up to about 50 feet. And uh, I have seen some nest boxes, um, not quite 50 feet, but tall. And you would have to use a, a, a retractable mirror to be able to monitor that high. So I certainly don't recommend that, but it's, uh, it's, it's doable. <laughs> Minimum spacing is 300 feet between boxes. Um, I would say that that is really a minimum. I would not go any more than that. Uh, birds really are very protective of their nest box, of course. And one of the things that you'll find is that they will build dummy nests. So they will fill a box with part of a nest and never use it. They'll just leave it that way so that another bird won't come along and use it. Um, they'll think that it's taken. So that may be something that is happening if you have uh, too many uh, nest spots nearby. And then ideally we want that box to face east so that it does not get 
the hot afternoon sun coming in the opening. Um, if east is not an option, then north is the next best direction. And for my boxes, I have a little tag that I put on them. Uh, one of one purpose is just so that it has a number on it for me so that I know which box I'm at. Um, I have over 50 boxes and, and after a while they all start to look the same. I'm not really sure where I'm at anymore. Uh, after you visit boxes twice a week for 50 of them over and over. So it helps me to know where I'm at, but it also gives uh, information to people who are curious about those boxes. Uh, if you are planning to work with the Master Naturalist or Master Gardeners or some other uh, association, um, I would encourage you to, uh, to look into some kind of tag uh, for the boxes so that people know that they're monitored and um, so that people won't bother the boxes. A lot of people uh, have asked me, are these um, feeders? And have mistaken them for, uh, for us putting bird food inside them. Um, so I take the opportunity as I'm going around just to educate people a little bit on what the boxes are used for, why we're doing it, and, um, and again, pointing out the birds in the area. So what's involved in monitoring? Um, nest box week in a problem. Uh, Reporting the nest activities to a group coordinator, if that's uh, the situation in the master naturalist group. Um, I am part of the Cross Timbers chapter, which is the Fort Worth area. And uh, we have different group coordinators um, that uh, the volunteers will report back to a group coordinator instead of everyone um, having to report all on their own to Nest Watch. So it just helps us to, to work together as a big group rather than individually. But you can certainly do that differently in your organization. Or uh, if you're doing it on your own, you may uh, just be reporting your one box to Nest Watch, and that's perfectly fine. Um, you would also be maintaining and repairing boxes. Uh, you can see the box in the picture is, is one of the older boxes. And um, it was uh, probably one of the, I would say, well-maintained boxes. Um, when I started, they were uh, literally falling apart. The screws were coming out. Um, the, the box, the lids were coming off. There were all sorts of problems. Um, but you can see this one also, the hinge on it opens upward. So uh, it, this is one of those that I was talking about. It's very difficult to clean out the box because you have to get down into it. Um, and then the other reason for monitoring is uh, to help educate the community. Um, if you're working in a, a park or something like that, then you will have people that will ask you what you're doing, or you can take that opportunity to invite kids over um, and tell them what you're working on and why. And it, it helps just uh, to inform the community a little bit more and help them to be interested in the conservation as well. So why monitor bluebirds? Um, one of the, the reasons is, of course, it increases our understanding of the breeding biology of birds. Um, as the, the suitable breeding sites have declined, many species are decreasing in number. And so there's a lot of just information that we don't know. Um, how we impact the birds by, uh, by installing these nest boxes is not entirely known. And so every little bit of data helps. Um, we, we learn something new almost every year. And the picture on this slide is a great um, example of that. In two 2013, we had uh, a monitor in Pennsylvania who uh, very carefully documented his nest boxes. And as you can see, he had four eggs on the left but if you uh, are um, able to count the birds on the right, there's five. And he was able to document twinning. So the egg in the bottom right uh, of the nest is actually a twin egg. 
And that was something that had not been documented before. And that was done by someone uh, like us who was just monitoring Bluebird boxes uh, for Nest Watch and found out something very, very interesting. So here's a little bit of an example of my, uh, my success, as I call it. When I started in 2018, um, the boxes had not been monitored for one year previous. And they had, uh, they had been in disrepair, but I came along in 2018 and made no changes and uh, just monitored them as I was uh, taught to do, I guess. Um, and 55% fledged successfully. And as you can see, I, I didn't know whether that was a good number or uh, a bad number. I had no clue. Um, <clears throat> I've since learned that that's not terribly bad. Uh, the next year, I uh, was very blessed to get a grant from the Audubon Society and was able to install a bunch of new boxes and make some changes um, to improve the, the overall quality of the boxes, as well as uh, just the monitoring. And that in itself made some changes uh, to the, the percentage of um, fledglings. And uh, then in 2020, my uh, hopefully my great success year, I guess, as I look at it, uh, was when I finally had decided some of the boxes were in the wrong place. They were um, on a linear trail three miles long, and there was not a lot of thought given to the direction that they were put in or how close they were. And so I made some of those changes, spread them out through different parks, different locations, and um, and immediately saw a, a better return. You can see that the number of failed eggs. And that could be failed because of weather, could be failed because the egg just didn't hatch for whatever reason, could be predator, could be any number of reasons. Um, but the failure rate went down significantly. And that has continued the last couple of years. And I didn't update it the last couple of years because it's just been the same, um, the same rate. Um, so we've been very fortunate with that, especially with the freeze that we had a couple of years ago, not to, to really impact that overall. So uh, this year, 54 boxes. Uh, also, I think I mentioned in 2018, it was only, we only had 30 boxes at that time. So we've increased quite a few boxes in the area as well. So let's talk about monitoring those boxes. Um, Observations are the, the point of monitoring the box, the nest, but that should never jeopardize the well being of the bird. So, there are three potential risks that all nest monitors must be careful to avoid accidental harm to a nest, parental desertion of a nest, and attracting predators to a nest. And we'll talk about each of those. So when you're monitoring a nest, let's talk about some of the steps that you'll go through. First, you'll plan and prepare in advance. So any materials that you would have with you, um, let's assume that you're monitoring in a park. You would have any kind of data sheets, notebooks. Um, if you're using a mobile app, you might have that ready. Nestbox, uh, Nest Watch does have a mobile app available. Um, before your visit, so that you are minimizing the time that you are spent at the nest and, uh, and limiting that to no longer than one minute so that you are putting minimal stress on uh, the parents and the nestlings and, um, and keeping that box open uh, the minimal amount of time so that uh, the weather, if it's windy, it's not cooling the eggs. Um, if it's, uh, if they're, being incubated, then the mom, the the mother's not having to fly away and come back um, to incubate. Uh, we're disturbing it as little as possible. So plan and prepare in advance. You'll want to visit every three to four days or at least once a week 
our hope is that we are visiting uh, eight to 10 times during that uh, brood period. Um, they, it, it, because it's so quick, uh, we like to see a visit every uh, three to four days. So um, they just grow so quickly that that's the reason for it. Choose appropriate times to visit the nests. Um, we kind of have a, a, a rule of thumb, I guess, that two hours after sunset is the earliest, uh, I'm sorry, after sunrise is the earliest time to start. So if the sun rises at seven o'clock, you wouldn't start monitoring until about nine o'clock in the morning. And uh, same with sunset, uh, about two hours before sunset, you should have finished your monitoring. That gives the birds time to do their thing. Again, you're not uh, causing problems with cooling the nest or, um, or disturbing them at their busiest time. Number four, approach the nest with care. Observe your surroundings. Look for bluebirds uh, in the trees. Look for predators. Look for box issues. This is your chance to, um, to really look around and observe as you're approaching so that uh, you can decide if this is, if you need to, to wait another minute and let an adult leave before you, uh, before you approach the box. Um, it might be a good time to do that. Uh, you will approach the nest, make a little bit of noise. You'll wanna talk or whistle just so that you're not startling the bird. Um, a lot of times they are gone throughout the day, especially when it gets later in the summer and they don't have to incubate the eggs as long. Um, they just let the heat of the day do that for them. Uh, but when they are there incubating, you do want to give them a heads up that you're coming and that you're uh, gonna be stopping at the box. So I find that talking or whistling uh, to them helps that. Um, avoid walking or standing in front of the opening hole. Uh, it seems obvious, but until you've done it <laughs> and had a bird fly at you, uh, it's a lesson that, that you won't forget then, I'm, I'm sure. Um, tap gently and wait a few seconds for the bird to leave if she's going to leave. So we uh, tap gently on the nest box, give it a minute, um, tap again, and then open the box and uh, peek gently, try to, you know, peek in without startling her. And, um, and half the time you'll find out that she's not there anyway, which is <laughs> okay. Um, but th that one time that you are thinking everything is fine, you saw a bird fly out, so it should be good. Turns out it was the male and you didn't notice it and the female's still inside. Or um, I had a, a wren fly straight at my face once. And so I'm very cautious with wrens. They're, they're a little trickier. <laughs> Number five, do not handle the birds or the eggs. Uh, we are here to observe. We are not to uh, trying to um, save them or, uh, or repair any damaged problems. Uh, we are not here to rehabilitate. Um, so if there's a problem of that magnitude, then we need to find a rehabber for the birds. Our job is just to observe the nesting activities. So we don't handle them, especially uh, when I'm talking with other um, residents in the area, telling them how excited I am about the birds. I don't handle the birds or the eggs. I don't pull the nest out of the box. Um, I'll kind of help the kids to you know, stand up tall enough so that they can see it. Um, sometimes I have a step stool with me, just depends on, on my boxes, um, but I do not uh, handle the birds or the eggs. Um, or any parts of the bird nest. Uh, there's something called the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which we'll talk about in just a second. Don't leave a dead end trail. Uh, this is for predators. If you walk straight up to a box and turn around and walk away, then you are uh, basically leaving a trail for predators to know, hey, there's something really good here. And uh, I've seen it happen. It surprised me, um, but I have 
seen uh, raccoons follow the trail right to a nest box. Um, they'll, they'll follow that footpath right there. So be very cautious and try to, to, to leave different paths so that you're not um, walking straight up to it and leaving that dead end. And then finally, you're gonna record your data on your mobile app or data sheet as you, uh, as you move away. So go ahead and close up the box and move away to take your notes. I personally jot down very quick notes in the field on a piece of paper. And then I update everything on the website after I get home again. Um, sometimes I update on the mobile app while I'm in the field, just depends on um, how what I have with me at that time and whether or not I'm wanting to upload photos as well. So there are, um, there are options to upload photos to the app so that you can keep photos to see what has happened previous uh, on previous visits and compare that data. So that's one of those things that when you're preparing your visit to this box, you'll want to look back and see, okay, what am I expecting? Am I expecting four eggs? Uh, am I expecting them to have hatched already? Should they um, be ready to fledge? That sort of thing. And here's the Migratory Bird Treaty Act that I was talking about. Um, it is illegal to uh, take, possess, import, export, transport, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, any part of a bird, a nest, or eggs. And so where that comes into play, we are monitors. We do have a to open, close, and observe the, the nesting situation. Um, we are removing the used nest to continue monitoring that, which has been uh, sort of approved as it were. Um, no one really wants to say, uh, to put all of this in writing, but this is as close as we've gotten. Um, and I've put a little bit of a source information here uh, down at the bottom. But um, so if you're cleaning out a nest, you're able to do that, but you cannot keep the nest and display it without permit. Um, you cannot keep uh, the eggs, even if they're old and dried out. Um, you cannot keep bird feathers at all. None of that is allowed. So let's talk about what you're likely to find in a bluebird nest box. Hopefully you find bluebirds. That's the that's the goal, uh, but not always. Uh, bluebirds will build very neat nests. They use very neat grasses. They pile them up. They have a very deep cup, and they will lay one egg every morning until they have laid as many as they're going to. Which, uh, like I said, the average is five. And um, most of the time they're blue. You can see these are kind of a, the white creamy one on the bottom, which uh, we get occasionally too. I feel like those are just a, a surprise and always a joy. There's, there's nothing different about them. It's just the color that ended up in the eggs. Um, some will tell you the reason behind it has to do with the age of the bird or um, the, the pigments in the the egg itself. And what we found basically is that none of that matters. The birds still come out looking the same. Uh, they incubate the eggs after all of the eggs have been laid. So she will lay an egg on Monday um, and leave it and come back on Tuesday and, and lay another egg and leave it and come back on Wednesday. And after she's laid all of the eggs, then she will start incubating so that they all will be ready to fledge at the same time, so that they're all the same age. And females keep the nest very clean by removing fecal sacs and uneaten food regularly. They are probably one of the cleanest birds that I have worked with um, in the, the cavity nesting bird categories. So let me show you some of the other ones. Um, Carolina chickadee, uh, they also are cavity nesting birds. Um, these are, are all, uh, as a matter of fact, 
uh, native birds as well. So if you happen to have something else that nests in your box, um, I say take it for the gift that it is. It might not be the bluebird that you were hoping for. And uh, we can certainly talk about things that might encourage the bluebirds over other birds. Um, some small changes might help make that more uh, intriguing to those bluebirds, but these are just as exciting um, to see other birds and they all offer something interesting as well. The chickadees, I find uh, one of my favorite things about the chickadees is that their nests are just gorgeous. They are made with a base of moss, strips of bark, uh, thinly lined with grass, feathers, uh, animal fur, snake skin. I'm not sure if you can uh, see, I'll move my pointer. I don't know if you can see it on the screen, uh, but there are all these bits down here in the bottom right picture here. Uh, and there is a piece of snake skin right there in that bottom right corner. Um, really interesting uh, nests. They they pull some very cool pieces of of the world around them into their nest. Uh, their eggs are white, uh, marked finely marked with reddish brown dots, spots, or blotches, and are often concentrated on the larger end with little or no gloss. They have three to ten eggs per clutch, with six being the most common. The female will fly off and watch. She's, she's uh, not one to stick around as you approach, but the nestlings can be very skittish, especially right before fledging, uh, which brings to mind something that I, I think I neglected to mention. Um, one of the things that, that we should not do is uh, check the boxes right before the uh, birds are ready to fledge because they may get a little skittish at that time and try to fledge during your visit and we wouldn't want something to happen. So uh, when, when you check your notes and see that there's a good possibility that they're ready to fledge, then we just observe from a distance or listen in to see are there birds still in there? Uh, but we try not to monitor uh, by opening the box in those, those situations. Oops, sorry, my screen doesn't want to advance. There it is. Bewick's wren is the next one on my list. Um, I, I kind of like the Bewick's wrens. They're a little fussy. Uh, they remind me of myself. They will um, flee the box and sit there and fuss at you the whole time. Um, they, they definitely don't like you being around. They'll fuss before you get there and they'll, they'll fuss the entire time. But they build, uh, I, I think it's a rather neat looking nest but it's usually made of bigger twigs and catkins um, and similar things on the outside and then lined with uh, feathers on the inside um, or other soft material. They have uh, typically five to seven eggs per clutch and um, the eggs are often uh, are an irregular brown color with Reddish brown spots often concentrated in a ring on the larger end, and they're smooth with little or no gloss. Uh, something interesting about the, the Buick's wren eggs is that they increase with egg order, with the last one being the largest. We also have Carolina wrens in the area, very similar looking. Um, but this is more of a rusty brown colored bird. Since they're often hard to see when they fly off, one of the ways that you can tell the difference is the nest. Carolina wrens build a, a nest that fills the box and often has a domed cover over it. So they have this uh, entrance type uh, cover. I'm looking at the two pictures uh, at the top you can see one is uh, like fine grasses, and then the next one is more leaves and um, parts of grasses and miscellaneous things, but they both have an opening to the top left, and that's significant of the Carolina wren. They typically have four to five eggs per clutch, um, also white or pale pink 
with uh, very heavy brown, reddish brown flecks, often concentrated at the larger end again. Tufted titmouse, beautiful bird, uh, but not quite as tolerant of monitoring. They have a, a fabulous way of telling you to get the heck out of their nest box. Um, females will stay on their nest and will hiss at you and will weave their head back and forth like a snake. So um, it's a fascinating display and it's, it's enough to make me leave. <laughs> I try not to bother them. Um, as a matter of fact, this particular uh, titmouse on the, the right picture, I finally just gave up and stopped opening the box. She was so adamant. She was not giving up. I never could see how many eggs she had. Um, she was always there, even after they had hatched. Um, she was always on the nest. So I never did get to see those. So they're a little bit less tolerant of people uh, monitoring them. Um, but they do use the, the boxes on occasion. And uh, one that I did not have uh, listed here is tree swallows, which will also use our nest boxes, but that's a little bit more rare. This is a, a great reference chart for you to see from day zero of uh, hatching to day 20 of fledging. Um, I use this chart quite frequently if I have uh, missed monitoring for some reason and I'm not sure exactly where they're at, how old they are. Um, I can look at the chart and kind of compare the nestlings that I see with the chart and they grow so much that I'm able to tell, okay, these are probably day nine or 10 and uh, estimate when they should fledge based on, on those days alone. So this chart is really interesting. It's from Cialis.org, but it can also be uh, found in that, um, the handout that I was talking about earlier, the, uh, the, the nestwatch.org manual. Let's talk about some of the not so happy things. Uh, house sparrows are invasive and uh, aggressive when it comes to bluebirds. They will take over bluebird boxes and bluebird nests. They will push out the bluebirds. Um, they will forcibly eject them from their boxes. And uh, so we have to be very proactive about watching for house sparrows and removing the nest as soon as we see them. Um, this is one that is, uh, is fairly easy to recognize. As you can see the nests on the right, they are quite messy. Um, it looks like somebody just crammed a bunch of bird feathers in. Uh, Maybe these were a little bit messier because of the location, uh, which happened to be by a pond. So they have access to a lot more duck feathers and um, and thinner grasses. But um, you can count on their their nest boxes being very messy and tall. Um, they will usually take up the entire box. So when you see something like that, if you are monitoring a box, I highly recommend that you remove that material. And um, if you are unsure, you can wait until the eggs are laid to make sure because they look absolutely nothing like uh, bluebird eggs, of course. Um, and they're quite distinct from the other eggs that might be uh, other native cavity nesters. But those should be removed. Uh, and that nest box may be closed off for a period of time until the house sparrows stop using it. I have some that I have to just close completely. It is better to not have a nest than it is to have a house sparrow move into a box. Um, it's They're that aggressive and detrimental to the bluebirds. Predators, competitors, and invasives. So uh, probably my biggest predator 
would be um, seen in the upper left corner, and that would be humans. Um, people putting sticks and rocks in the boxes. I don't know if you can tell, but there's a stick that's been placed into the box, and there's actually nestlings in that box. And luckily, uh, those nestlings were not harmed, and I was able to remove that stick. I'd it had been there at least uh, two days. It was not there the previous time that I checked, but uh, luckily uh, I was checking that box pretty regularly and they had not, not been injured at all. But that was a, sort of a wake up call to me that humans are probably the worst predators for us. Um, rocks are very common. I see um, uh, dog poop bags thrown, stuffed inside them, all sorts of things. So that's another reason why it's important to check our boxes regularly. Ants um, are, are quick to move in if you give them the opportunity. Um, there are uh, options for um, treating ants, uh, treating the poles of boxes so that they aren't induce or conducive to ants they don't encourage the ants um, you will also see uh, snakes wasp nests are pretty common uh, the best thing that you can do for the wasp nest is just to keep knocking them down before they get big um, one wasp is is typically not too much of a problem to uh, flush them out of the box and knock it down but three or four is is getting a little bit dangerous and risking your, your own safety. And there have been times where we've just walked away and said, we're not gonna monitor that box anymore. The, the wasps can have that one. It's just too dangerous for us. Um, the brown-headed cowbird on the right uh, is, uh, on cowbirds are native. Uh, they lay egg of other birds. And the, their offspring are raised by the, the birds that are raising the rest of that nest. So in this case, a cowbird has laid an egg in the nest of a bluebird, and the bluebird will raise that cowbird as if it were their own. And the negative side is that the cowbird is now competing for uh, food supplies, but also, the cowbird is a bigger bird, and so will often outcompete the bluebirds. But again, um, with a cowbird being a native bird, that's not something that we would want to um, to take any kind of action over. So, uh, in my uh, area, we do encourage uh, monitors to allow the the cowbird's eggs to remain. There's also no evidence of uh, any uh, overall decline of the bluebirds from cowbird activity necessarily. So what's next now? Hopefully you are um, interested in the bluebirds and uh, excited about maybe installing your own nest box or contacting uh, someone to uh, see if there's uh, an organization like the master, the master naturalists or master gardeners, someone that is monitoring bluebirds already, maybe the Audubon Society, and um, and getting uh, hooked up with them to participate, um, or as I said, setting up your own box in your own backyard. Register then at nestwatch.org and complete the certification quiz. Um, there is a quiz on the site that is meant to help you. No one's going to ask you for the, the results of the quiz. It is a guaranteed pass. You will take that quiz. Uh, you will repeat it until you pass. So there's no failing it. But it is important for you and for the birds that you pass and that you understand the the guidelines so that you're protecting the birds to the best possible ability. And if you have uh, paid attention from the beginning of this presentation, you should be able to go to the certification quiz 
and take that now and pass it just fine because all of the same information that's on the quiz has been in this presentation. A couple of sites you'll wanna visit, Texas Bluebird Society, again, especially if you're looking for nest box plans uh, or if you're wanting to purchase a nest box. Um, the Cornell Lab site, Nest Watch, is where we report our data to. And that's where I referred to the, uh, the manual, go to nestwatch.org. And also the, um, the certification uh, is there. Cialis.org is a huge website about not only bluebirds, but all sorts of other cavity nesting birds. Um, but great, great information, including the, the different uh, phases day by day of the birds. And then, of course, the North American Bluebird Society. And I thank you again and uh, hope you enjoyed it. And I'm, I'm open to any questions you might have. Um, hi, Kimberly. Um, there are a couple of questions in here. Um, someone asked, um, do bluebirds and chickadees compete for nest boxes? Yes, uh, any of the cavity nesters can compete for nest boxes. Um, they will generally um, claim it. Uh, I, I won't say that they will fight over them. Um, there's no there's no guarantee that a bluebird will always win over a chickadee or anything like that. Um, I my experience is that if a chickadee is going to use a box. The bluebird has already given up that area and uh, and is not interested in it for whatever reason. Um, so I have one box that chickadees <clears throat> use every year, and I've never seen a bluebird try to to move into that box at all. And <clears throat> it's consistent. So so they they will fight over boxes uh, or they will try to use the same boxes. Uh, but that's why they spend so much time starting in January looking for boxes is they try to avoid that, that, that uh, argument. So there's like a sort of turf war a little bit. Exactly. Yeah. Especially if they're too close to each other. Okay. Um, another participant asked, um, is it okay to put sealer on the box so that it is more weather hardy? Um, that's going to depend on your sealer, but my general answer is no, it's not necessary. Um, if you are going to put something on it, I would limit it to the outside and, uh, I would be very cautious of what you, what you put on it. Um, we've had Boy Scouts that have painted boxes before. Um, you never know whether that paint has lead in it or whether it's uh, hobby paint or, uh, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, I have used stains, waterproof stains on the outside uh, with good luck. Um, but again, just, just keep it to the outside and you should be fine. But I wouldn't okay. do any kind of uh, thick paint. Now, I will say that we have painted boxes white in the past because of the heat, but I don't know what kind of paint was used. That was before my time. Okay. And then um, another um, person put some tips in there about um, that the sealer is not needed, a sloped roof, galvanized nails, and a recessed floor will help weatherproof the nest box. Um, Absolutely. Tip, yes. Uh, uh, someone yes. typed in the chat. Um, there are uh, there are holes in the boxes in the corners because you don't want it to um, you want it to have airflow as well as uh, you want the the rainwater to if it does get inside to drip through. So weatherproofing um, the wood is a good idea, but not the the box itself. Um, and then another person asked, um, what site do you take the quiz on? Nestwatch.org. Okay. Um, and then um, another person asked, uh, 
Can you talk about, oh, thanks, you're gonna bring it yeah, back. Yeah, I'm gonna go back to this site right there. Okay, nestwatch.org. Um, and look okay. for the nest monitoring manual. Those are the two okay. most important things. Okay, thanks for uh, bringing that back. Um, can you talk about the grant that you received? That, that was uh, one of the questions in there as well. Sure. Um, I, uh, my local Audubon group does a grant every year uh, for, for different purposes. And uh, someone had brought up to me that, uh, that my, my um, paltry little boxes could, could probably, uh, be something that they would consider. So I wrote in saying that I had actually already spent the money uh, to buy new boxes myself. I, I just believed in it that much. And um, so I spent the money and sent in receipts and said, here's what I did. I, uh, I bought 10 new boxes and 10, uh, all of the poles and things that needed to go with it and um, was gracious enough to to get a, an, an award for um, for recouping some of the costs that I put into it. Okay. Uh, that was a local Audubon, uh, the Fort Worth Audubon. Is there any other um, questions for uh, Kimberly? Uh, or clarifications uh, about the presentation slideshow? I'm also going to uh, flip back to the end now where my email is. It's KimberlyTX at gmail.com. And please feel free to, uh, to email me. I don't mind giving you my cell phone number, but I don't answer it unless you're already in my phone. So <laughs> you'll have to email first anyway. <laughs> So KimberlyTX at gmail.com. I will answer all your questions there. Feel free uh, to write anytime or just to write to say that you saw the presentation is wonderful. I love it. Uh, we do have some comments uh, um, saying that you did a great presentation and uh, thank you so much. Um, and then there's another question here. It says, um, can you talk a little bit about millworms uh, feeding the birds? I generally do not provide supplementary food. Um, I have not found that to be the case, uh, to be necessary. Um, the birds have, have, uh, have always done just a fine job. The only time that I have ever really considered it was when I had uh, the, the brown-headed cowbirds uh, lay eggs in the nest, which happens occasionally. Um, I do monitor those to make sure that the bluebirds are also getting enough food. So if they look like they're really wimpy looking, I will uh, put out some of the mealworms, but I have found that other birds will get to them first. You really have to uh, protect them, put them in a, a, a box that only bluebirds can get to and it's a little bit more than I was able to do. So, um, so I found that mother nature knows best on that. So in general, providing a feeder with mealworms with it is great, um, but trying to, to focus mealworms on bluebirds has not been very successful for me. Um, that is, as far as I know, the questions that we have about uh, the bluebirds. Um, and uh, I appreciate that this timely um, presentation. I know that's going to be happening pretty soon, and these birds are going to be uh, looking at apartments.com or, you know, trying <laughs> to find their new spot um, soon. Um, that they are. Keep your eyes out there, out there now, looking for new spots. So. Hopefully they will find some in your in your backyard and you can start monitoring those boxes too. 
All right. Well, thank you so much, Kimberly. And um, thank you everyone for joining us. And um, we look forward to seeing you next month. Uh, the, we do this presentation every the third Saturday of every month. Um, so uh, I appreciate everyone and uh, go out there and check out some of these birds and some of these nests. So. Thank you.